Good evening and good uh, morning and good day, my friends. Our topic for today is set free by the truth, the search for God's church. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, be merciful to us. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit so that we can understand your word and search for the truth church in the Bible. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Bless those who are watching and also listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story is told of a young man in ancient Greece who wanted to find the truth. He approached an old man who was considered the wisest man in the city. The young man asked the old man, Wise sir, tell me please, how can I find the truth? Can you lead me to it? The wise old man got up and began walking. The young man followed. They walked through the streets of the city to the seashore. The old man kept walking into the water. When they were about waist deep into the water, the old man told the young man to put his hands upon his head. Then he dunked the young man under the water. Three times the young man came up gasping for air. Three times the old man pushed his head under down the water. By the third time, the, one, the young man was screaming, All I wanted was to find the truth. The wise man responded, When you desire truth, as much as you wanted the next breath of air, you will find it. There's some wisdom that we can glean from the wise old Greek man. Truth isn't difficult to find. The problem is that our hearts often aren't really that committed to knowing the truth, especially if we fear that it may suggest making changes in our lives. Our God, the one who himself is truth himself, isn't playing hard to find. He doesn't try to make truth elusive or hidden or mysterious. Instead, he wants nothing more than to constantly lead us into a greater understanding of the truth. He wants us to have a continually growing knowledge of him and his character of love. But that knowledge needs to be put into practice, something that can only happen if in our hearts we are fully, completely committed and surrendered to whatever truth will teach us. Jeremiah said it in this way in Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. That's not saying we have to search really hard for a hard to find God. It's saying we need to search with a heart that is already, with a heart surrendered to Him. But some people are searching in all the wrong places. They seek to find, to fill the emptiness in their lives with fame, fortune, drugs, alcohol, possessions, and recreational activities, only to discover when they reach their goals that there is no lasting satisfaction. Sooner or later, the question of the ancient prophet echoes from the past in Isaiah 55 too. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your wages for that what does not satisfy? Possessions will never satisfy. Jesus himself said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Luke 12, 15. Material things don't, don't bring happiness. Truth, satisfaction, and contentment can only come from a growing relationship with our Creator God, who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. God intended that His church should be the vehicle that brings the knowledge of Him and His truth to the world. In fact, that is one of the characteristics of his church throughout every age. They are the ones entrusted with God's truth and the responsibility for sharing it. Paul wrote to his young co-worker Timothy and said in 1 Timothy 3.15, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 But where can we find the pillar and ground of the truth today? New churches are always springing up all around the world. 
each claims to have a message that the world needs to hear. God never intended that this would be so confusing. In fact, Paul wrote that there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope of your calling in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That's not the way it seems today. With hundreds of denominations and all the disagreement about the truth. But it's how Jesus wants it to be. One church. In fact, he prayed for his disciples in John 17, 21. That they all may be one as you, Father, and me, and in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. John 17, 21. Jesus wanted the world to be able to recognize his followers by the unity and love. He did not want any divisions in the church. The Apostle Paul wrote that there should be no schism division in the body in 1 Corinthians 12, 25. But the, people, but the apostle also foretold the time when the apostasy would come into the church and with it divisions. We read in Acts 20, 28 to 30, Therefore, take heed of yourselves to yourselves and to all the flock to shepherd the church of God. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among you, Yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Acts 20, 28, 30. As we study church history, we discover that this is exactly what happened. False teachers arose and some accepted their errors and abandoned their faith. Others became confused. There was a gradual falling away from the teachings of Jesus. But through it all, God has had a church that has remained faithful. So what did that faithful church look like? And perhaps more importantly, what might it look like today? We do not have to study every religion and research every denomination. We only need to find the characteristics of God's church as given in His Word in the Bible. The God who loved us enough to die in our place must also want to make such important matters known to us. A prophet, the prophet Amos declared in Amos 3.7, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophet. And so, to his prophets, we want to turn for answers. The book of Revelation was written especially for the last days and contains special insights into our topic for this topic. It details the apostasy and religious confusion that will exist near the end of time. Chapter 12 of Revelation gives a panoramic view of church history from the time of Christ to the end of the world. Revelation 12, 1 and 2. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under his, her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. This is a quite a symbolism. A woman in white, clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, with a crown of twelve stars on her head, and with such, what does such symbol mean? In Bible prophecy, a pure woman represents God's people, His church. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Jeremiah 6.2 And who is Zion? Through Isaiah, God said, Say to Zion, you are my people. Isaiah 51.16 Are we, as we compare these two texts, we see that God used a virtuous woman and beautiful woman as a symbol of his church, his people.
The Apostle Paul used similar term terminology to refer to the Christian church in Corinth. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. <clears throat> the prophet John, however, was also shown another very different woman, whom he described in Revelation chapter 17. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. The woman was arraigned in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her head a golden, in her hand, a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. And on her forehead was written, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. That's in Revelation 17, 3 to 5. This symbolic language, my friends, describes an impure woman, the false church, a fallen religious system that has been unfaithful to Christ and has compromised Bible truth. James used similar language to symbolize spiritual unfaithfulness. James 4.4 4, Adulteresses, adulterers and adulteresses, do you, know, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? An impure woman then represents a false religious system, while a pure woman represents God's pure people. Okay, let's look again at the description of the woman. Being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelation 12, 2 and 4. Who was this dragon? that stood before the woman to devour her child as soon as he was born? Who was represented? Who is the child by the child? Revelation explains these symbols also. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they were not, did they not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the ser that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How about the child? Regarding the child, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Only one child in history of the world was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and to be caught up with God to God in his throne. And who is that? That is Jesus. Speaking of the second coming of Jesus, John said, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that, will, that with it she should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with them with a rod of iron. So that's Jesus who can rule the whole earth, Revelation 19, 15. Paul tells how Jesus was caught up to God's throne when God said, Raise God, when God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 20. So we can find out in the Bible, yes, Jesus was the male child and that dragon attempted to destroy him. Working through the pagan Roman Empire, Satan tried to take Jesus' life as soon as he was born. Herod, the Roman governor, decreed that all male children, two years and under, should be killed. But an angel warned Mary and Joseph to escape to Egypt with Jesus. Through his life, Jesus was constantly attacked by Satan through temptation and persecution. When Jesus was put to death on Calvary's cross, Satan thought he had won the battle. But an empty tomb demonstrated the triumph of the Savior of the world. Christ arose and ascended to his Father's throne, just as Revelation describes. Failing in an attempt to destroy God's Son, Satan turned his wrath on the woman, Christ's church. Satan could no longer touch Jesus personally, so he viciously attacked Christ's followers. All but one of Jesus' disciples died a martyr's death. The Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome 
Christians were tortured and thrown into dungeons, many sealing their testimony with their lives. In the first generation of the Christian church, while the apostles were still alive, the church stood firmly for the truth despite the persecution it endured. But after the death of the disciples, with the passing of time, some Christians compromised their faith and false teachings came into the church. In the fourth century, Emperor Constantine tried to hold the Roman Empire together by uniting pagans and Christians into one great system of religion. As a result, Christianity became accepted and even more popular. The pagans who joined this new Christianity brought many of their beliefs and practices with them. As the church embraced these errors, it lost sight of its original mission. One historian wrote, The new Christians were as far as thinking and habits went the same were the same all pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out their paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. That's from Centuries of Christianity, a concise history, page 58. However, during this time, there were Christians scattered throughout the world who remained faithful to God's truths and protested that the changes that crept into the church. They refused to compromise their position, and many were persecuted for their faith. Soon, the Roman rulers issued edicts, making it a crime punishable by death to reject the new pagan practices of the state church. Foreseeing all of this, John wrote, The dragon persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child in Revelation 12, 13. And what would happen to the woman? She fled into the wilderness where she was had a place prepared for God, that they should be feed her from 1,260 days. Revelation 12, 6. Notice, that this prophecy reveals how long God's people were to be persecuted. 1,260 days. We have already discovered that each day in Bible prophecy stands for a year of literal time. Ezekiel wrote in 4.6, I have laid you a day for each year. So the oppression of God's faithful people, as predicted in Revelation, was to continue for 1,260 years. History confirms this Bible prophecy. The Roman Emperor Justinian ordered the Roman general Belisarius to wipe out the Aryan powers that opposed the church in Rome. The last of this was eradicated in AD 538, and Justinian declared the Bishop of Rome to be the head of the church and the true and effectual corrector of heretics. The reign of intolerance for so-called heretics had begun. History confirms this Bible prophecy. The Roman Emperor Justinian ordered. So this is what happened. They were persecuted. Yet God's true church will always triumph. Following the invention of the printing press, the Bible was translated into the languages of common people and circulated wild, wildly. God's truth would not be hidden forever. Courageous reformers boldly proclaimed the word of God. Some, like Huss and Jerome, were captured and burned at the stake. Others, like Wycliffe, Tyndale, and Luther, were hunted and persecuted. But with the discovery of America, new freedom and a new refuge were provided for the persecution of Christians in Europe. On the shores of a new nation was laid the foundation of a civil and religious liberty. The era of compromise and persecution predicted in Revelation 12 finally came to an end in 17. 98. It ended when Napoleon sent General Berthier to take the Pope captive exactly 1,260 years after the predicted period of persecution began in 538. After 1798, we should begin to see a pure faith again in the open. The church would no longer be hidden in the wilderness. Notice how the prophet described the church that appeared after 1798. 
Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with a woman and he went to make war with the rest or the remnant of her offspring. There is a remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. In other words, the offspring of the woman, the spiritual descendants of the pure church of Jesus would once again be in the open after the period during which the pure church was scattered into the wilderness, which ended in 1798. We should begin to see the characteristics of the early church emerging once again. But does that mean that every church that teaches obedience to God's commandments? Not exactly. Many religious bodies today teach their members in one way or another that God's law is no longer relevant to the Christian. For example, some congregations bow before images and icons. Others ignore the sacredness of God's name. And the most of the religious world has lost sight of the memorial creation described in the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all your work. But the seventh day of the Sabbath is the Lord your God. Exodus 28 to 10. Not only was God's last day church to keep the commandments of God, but the prophecy also says that it will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation 19, 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. God's last day church will have the gifts of the spirit, including the spirit of prophecy. We will look more closely at this exceptional gift in a later presentation. But there are still other characteristics that we can use to identify God's last day church. Its message is symbolized in Revelation 14 by three angels flying in the heavens. The first angel proclaims the everlasting gospel in a very remarkable way. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. God's end time church movement will be worldwide, taking his message to the entire world and Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. God's end time church movement will be worldwide taking the gospel to the whole world. And what will be the message included? A warning to those living during earth's last hours regarding the arrival of God's judgment. And a call to worship the creator using unmistakable language borrowed directly from the Sabbath commandment. But the second angel has a message that is also extraordinary. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, 8. God's last day people will not sugarcoat sin and apostasy. This message points out the confused mixture of human traditions and teachings in the religious world. The last and solemn appeal is given to the third portion of the prophecy. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, Revelation 14, 9 and 10. This world is to be warned against worshiping the beast and his image or receiving his mark. Why such a serious warning? Why such a politically incorrect message saying error is wrong and dangerous? It is because God loves us. He wants us to take a stand for the truth so we can so that we can be spared the temptations of staying in fellowship with error and confusion. He wants us to be close to him. Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them I must also bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. John 10, 
16. God has faithful followers in all churches, but there will come a time when there will be one true fold, one true body of believers. Jesus said that his sheep will be called out of those other bodies that have not carefully followed God's word. John the Revelator details the call in Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. God's faithful followers must be called out of religious error and confusion that exists at the end of time. You will want to notice how the Bible describes the people who are called out of Babylon, the religious confusion that will just exist, exist just before Jesus returns. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his harp in his hand a sharp sickle. Revelation 14, 12 to 14. Just before Jesus comes, his people are described again as keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay, let us briefly review some of the distinguishing characteristics of God's last day church that we may have seen so far in the Bible. God's remnant church was to appear after the period of terrible persecution, which ended in 1798. They will keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. They will have the gifts of the Spirit, including the prophetic gift. They will have a worldwide work and message. They will call the world back to the true worship of the Creator. They will warn of judgment and tell of the soon return of Jesus. All churches may look alike at first glance. But as you study God's description of the genuine in His Word, it will be quite, it is quite easy to eliminate those that do not have these biblical characteristics. Perhaps you have been searching, trying to sort through the confusion in the religious world today, looking for God's last day church. I believe that there is only one true church. It is a Bible believing Christ centered sabbath keeping worldwide advent movement it teaches what jesus taught that's why i am a seventh day adventist i am a seventh day adventist today because simply as a disciple of jesus i want to follow him he believed death was asleep i believe the same he thought that he would return i look forward to that day he kept the sabbath holy and expected his followers to do so as well. I want to keep his special day sacred each week. I know each of us is growing in our understanding of truth, but I just want to follow Jesus as closely as I can possibly. How about you, my friend? As we have studied these messages from night and day and tonight, have you learned the new truth? Have you heard the Spirit seeking to your heart? speaking to your heart, inviting you to follow Jesus more closely as well. His voice always calls up higher to a more abundant life. When he teaches us the truth, we are blessed if we follow it. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. John 13, 17. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the Bible identifying the true church. Thank you for the map in the end time. Thank you for ensuring that there will be a true church, ensuring through prophecy that we can find the church through the descriptions in the Bible. Our Father, help us to be faithful to your word as the Bible describes the true, true church. Help us not be lost. Those of us who are, who are still wondering as you have prophesied, please bring them, help us bring them to the fold. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.